Um, I feel that I come with a, sorry, with a very simple story about a very small place compared to these amazing people. Um, I work for an organization very close to here, about 10 minutes away, called SEBS Project India. And we work with people in the tribal area that was mentioned earlier called Jawadi Hills. Uh, there's 225 tribal villages in these hills. We also work with rural communities around here and also a group of people who live in the slums near the old bus stand of Bellor here. Our job is to assist com communities to overcome social and economic challenges to development. That's our job. But what is development is a very politicized uh, word today. A lot of people talk about the mill Millennium Development Goals. A lot of NGOs talk about their own definitions of, their, of development. But to us, it is people at a grassroots level identifying what it is that they need to overcome poverty according to them and helping them find the opportunities to overcome those challenges. If you go to anybody living in the slums here in Velour and you try and offer them some improvement in their nutrition, they'll say, look, I don't really care. All I need is enough money to be able to, to feed myself tomorrow. So this is what it really comes down to, is asking people what they want and making it happen. The title, Imagine, Innovate, and Inspire of this conference got me thinking about how I've come to see the field that I work in, development. In every project that works, it always seems to come down to one special person who was inspired. They are always the person in the middle. And I think inspiration is like a match. When you light a match, the, the flame burns upwards. It never burns downwards. You have to start at the bottom, and the fire will catch to everything that's around it and everything that's above it. You can see people like Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. But I've also met so many people like that as well. A mother of four in a tribal village here, a young tribal teacher, also slum dwellers, rag pickers. These are the people that we've built our projects around as an organization. They're the leaders in development. It is never the United Nations Development Program. It is never an NGO like us. It is never a large, a large aid agency. We can only facilitate to create opportunities for those people to catch fire. My career started at a place called Shelter in the UK, where I used to work on the street every day of the year, even when it was very cold, raising funds for, an, for this organization. What they used to do is find homeless people, try and put them in a shelter, and then try and rehabilitate them, try and give them work, try and get them back up on their feet. And they were very, very successful at this. But there are so many challenges to this kind of work. One day, it was the middle of winter, it was about November, and I came across a man sitting on a park bench. He was about 50 years old, and I started talking to him. All he had for company was a bottle of vodka. He said he hadn't spoken to anyone in four days. And I found out that his story was, he'd been a professor at a university, a very big university in the, in the UK, the Imperial College of London. And he'd got cancer, and he'd had to move back in with his mother. He didn't get along with her partner, and they kicked him out onto the streets. Nobody helped him at the beginning, and he'd become so distrustful of everybody that I couldn't get him to come into a shelter. I pleaded with that man on that park bench, freezing myself. For about four hours, I got told off by my boss. I got into all sorts of trouble. And in the end, I threw up my hands and I went, I can't do anything for this man. And it was so frustrating. And I decided that what my life really should be about is helping people find what it is, spark that match, to make that change, to find that progress. So I took myself off around Asia. I took myself around the world. I enrolled myself in a Bachelor of Anthropology and a Master of Development Studies. And I came out armed with the United Nations uh, Charter of Human Rights, memorized. I had all sorts of statistics. I had all sorts of techniques under my belt. And I went to the United Nations Refu Refugee Agency and went, I'm ready to make a change now. So I was working with them. And I worked with some amazing people from mostly all over Africa, people from Ethiopia who had seen terrible famine, who had seen people they loved die of starvation. I worked with women, so many women who had been raped. I worked with so many people who had seen their families killed in front of themselves. And I was so inspired by these people, but the frustrating thing was, though they had been given everything that an organization can give, they'd been given documents when they had none, they'd actually been given a new country, they'd been given a new place to live, they had found it impossible to move forwards, and they were just trapped in a bubble of hopelessness. So many of these people, not everybody, but so many of these people. And I came away from this place thinking, 
wow, I still don't know how to do it. I still don't know how to help people move out of the challenges that they're facing. I need to do better than this. So I gave up my job, I gave up my salary, and I came to volunteer in India. I replied to an, ad to an advertisement for a volunteering position to help a group of tribal people who live in a very remote area. Most families are living on 600 rupees a week, uh, sorry, a month, and most families have seven children to support on that. They can no longer farm the land as they traditionally did, and they can no longer, so many of them, even manage to eat three meals a day. They were desperate for some kind of alternative form of livelihoods, and most of these people had gone into logging the forest, making alcohol, and all sort of destructive behaviors that were leading to things like domestic violence, child trafficking. This community was disintegrating, and it's in one of the most developed states of India. So I came over with a group of volunteers, all ready to go. And I, I said, okay, we're going to create a self-help group. We're going to get the women of this village together. We are going to empower them. We're going to give them skills. We're going to make it happen. So we organized a little group of women. I spent all of my days going from house to house in the village saying, come for skills training. I'll teach you how to make bags. We'll sell them to universities like VIT and conferences. And they said, yeah, we'd love to come. We'd love to come. And then every evening for about three months, I sat on the steps of the school, waiting for three to four hours a night, wondering why not a soul would turn up. And at the same time, these women were sitting in their houses, I later found out, absolutely petrified of this crazy white lady who'd come to work in their, in their village. And their husbands wouldn't let them go. They were all so scared of us. And then a miracle happened. This lady, Tangma, turned up on the steps of the school and said, my husband wouldn't let me come but I'm here, I snuck out, teach me to make a bag. So I sat down with this lady, with my translator, and she worked for about five hours to try and work out how to use a sewing machine. Finally, she managed to st stitch a straight line, and in her eyes, you saw that little match light, and there was a flicker of possibility. She could see, life could be easier if I could do this. There is a possibility, there is a future here. What Tangama did, was spread her fire to the whole of the rest of the village. Within months, every household in the village was involved in a self-help group. And we built an entire eco-trail program around her, which is when college students from universities like VIT come to her tribal village, and she teaches them about her knowledge system. She started off, here's her Tangamar and the sewing machine. Here's the other women in the village. Today, we have over a 1,000 students every year coming to see Tangamara and the other women in the village. She has managed to triple the incomes of every family in the village, and every family is sending their children to school, which was their eventual dream. We have 20 village tailors. We have accountants. We have tripled incomes. These women are empowered. And most importantly, I feel, it's given them a chance to stay in the forest because so many tribal communities now are forced out of the forests and the places where they live to make way for development. But this is what I feel actual development is, is giving people a chance to overcome whatever challenges they're facing. So this is Tangama's story. Then we also have, oh, to go back to that, I'd just like to mention that this program was amazing in that we had so much state support. Never once have the forest department told us that we can't take students into the forest. They've always sent forest guards. They've given so much support, and this has been vital to keep that flame going. Looking at another one of our programs, Goodbye to Paper, we identified a group of 10 women working in the, working in the slums as rag pickers, which, for those of you who don't know what it means, it means just picking rubbish up, up off the street and trying to sell it. It's a very, perceived as a very lowly job. People are very much looked down upon. These women were born on the street, they were raised on the street, and they were planning on doing the same for their children as well. Some of them have been forced into prostitution. Many of them were pregnant by the age of 14. They were terribly in debt. Some of them are sharing husbands. Some of them are abused by their husbands. It's a terrible situation for them. We just got these women together to try and help them make these lamps that we use for weddings. It was just a one-time project. But it really inspired them, and it made them think, hey, we've got some support here. Maybe we could progress. Maybe we could develop. Maybe we could reach what we want, which is a home and enough food on the table for our families. These women made lamps for a couple of years, and then we spent a year and a half 
trying to plan a way that they could start their own businesses. After a year and a half of struggle, when so many people, including myself and all of our staff, nearly gave up, we managed to get these women ration cards, identity documents, bank accounts. They were fully fledged citizens, and that was a huge struggle. We battled a lot of bureaucracy for this. On this day, all of these women had a cart, and they were ready with coffee shop businesses, fruit stall businesses, ironing businesses. They had the plans in their head. They were all so excited. We were, the, the energy was so amazingly high that day. But then, after about a week, one lady brought back her card. She threw up her hands and said, I'm, I've had enough of this. I spend all of my day wheeling this card around, trying to make some business, and it was going well, but I had to pay so many bribes and fines that I ended up losing everything that I made. I got shouted at by police. I got into so much trouble. I give up. And her match was definitely blown out. Now, when a match has been blown out, no matter how many times you strike it, it's never going to relight. And we've been working with this lady for the last six months, and I can't see her ever wanting to try that again. It shows that community development does work, but only when there's some kind of state support. If there's ever any wind ready to blow out that flame, everything will fall apart. There's a boy called Sri Devasan who we met when I got a phone call one day about two and a half years ago. I was working in one of the tribal villages. And um, his family called and said, please, please help us, please help us. You don't know us, but this man's had a terrible burn, and we need your help. First thing I always do is say, can't you do it yourself? Why don't you try and do it yourself? Try and empower people. They said, no, nah, got to come. So I came to the bottom of this hill, and I waited for these people to come down. And 10 tiny tribal men came down carrying a big bamboo stick with a big blanket wrapped around it. When they came down, I opened up the blanket and I saw a man in his mid-40s crumpled up inside. From here down on this leg and here down on this leg, his legs were like a skeleton's. They were just covered in charred flesh. It was a terrible, terrible burn. What had happened was he'd had untreated epilepsy for 10 years. He was petrified of doctors didn't know how to access a hospital. Often when tribal people go to the hospital, the doctors can't understand them, they get shouted at, it's a disaster. So he was petrified of going to the hospital for this epilepsy. One day he had a seizure and he fell into the fire and he lay there for half an hour. His legs were completely burnt. So they took him to the government hospital, who asked for 2,000 rupees registration, and then they didn't understand what happened next. They got scared and these people ran away from the hospital. 20 days later, the man's dying of gangrene. He's the only earner in his family. He tried to educate his children. His children were trekking nine kilometers a day down a hill to get to the nearest functioning school. They were trying so hard, but everything fell apart for them. Eventually, we managed to get this man an emergency um, amputation for both of his legs. And he lives in his village today on top of a hill with no legs. And it's a hard life when you live in a place with no roads and you don't have any legs and you can't use a wheelchair. His son, Srinivasan, came out of this so inspired by the trauma of what his dad went through. And he said, I don't want anything like this to happen to my community again. And today, Srinivasan, every month, goes to every house in the surrounding five villages, and that is a long way. He covers at least 60 kilometers a month doing this, as well as studying for a degree in education at Varese College down the road. And he works with these people providing first aid, building upon their existing traditional health system with new forms of knowledge, doing health education, educating about things like malnutrition. This is Srinivasan educating about anemia here at the bottom. He's also inspired other people in other villages to want to do the same. And I can categorically say that I know 12 people whose lives Srinivasan has definitely saved. And he's taken over 100 people to hospital and trained them how to use a hospital. He is definitely a fire waiting to happen, this boy. He's amazing. And he's only... Now he's about 19 years old. Srinivasan has a dream of continuing to bring change, positive change, to this tribal community. He has a dream of becoming a teacher and working in tribal schools because most of the tribal schools in Jawadi Hills that are government run are empty because they employ teachers who live so far away they can only go maybe one or two days a week for a few hours. But Srinivasan's right there and he's got the fire and he's got the passion and he wants to study. The thing is, there's so many structural, systemic threats to his dream. 
Desperate for money for fees, Srinivasan has been battling to get his caste certificate, which is what he needs to access tribal welfare department grants. Tribal students are trying to be uplifted by the government, uh, the government's trying to uplift them by giving them scholarships, tribal hostels. But the thing is, is that actually only a tiny percentage, 5 to 10 percent of people in our area have their caste certificates. And though we battle for those caste certificates to be distributed, it's very difficult to get them. So what happens is that people are passionate about education, they want to make a change, they've got a fire going, but unfortunately it gets dampened because they don't have all of those certificates. So what happens is that their flame goes out and they end up working in the alcohol industry. So this is the story of Srinivasan. What will be the outcome of Srinivasan's dream, I don't know. There are so many other Srinivasans in Javadi Hills. So what we've done is we've set up schools like these schools at the bottom. They're just little thatched huts, but they are filled with people from the hills who have a passion to make in their community, uh, to make a change in their community. And we're giving them the opportunity. The thing is, to make this sustainable, it all needs to be state supported. This is what we're doing to, to nurture these flames. When we look globally, we see structural barriers like this are affecting developing communities all around the world. Over-documentation, corruption, social stigmatization, these are the things that put a stop to progress. It's not that inspiration is not happening, it happens every day through good experiences and bad, there are matches being lit all over the place. But what I see and what I've seen through my, through my work is that too many times it's blown out. So what we need to do is we need to re-examine these complex structures in governance, in NGOs like our own, in large aid agencies, in international bodies like the United Nations. And we need to ask ourselves, is our bureaucracy actually destroying our work as soon as we start it? There was a recent World Bank report which found that community mobilization is the most effective way of making development happen, but only when it is state-supported. And actually, when it is not state-supported, when corruption stands in, it creates more harm than good, and it's better that you didn't do anything in the first place. So what I want to ask is, here in India, there's a lot of change happening. There are a lot of sparks being lit. But who is going to make sure that that fire doesn't get blown out? It's not just in governance that these changes need to happen. They need to happen in large organizations as well. They need to happen in every organization that every one of us is going to work in. We need to think, how are we going to make these things accessible to the poor? Thank you very much.